Let's start. I think one of the civic responsibilities of poets in America today is to continue to encourage a sense of civility among us and a sense of curiosity about one another's lives. Uh, there seems to be such a, a strident tone taking over in certain areas that I love the deep attribute of poetry to pause, to look, to listen, to respect, um, to pay attention to variety and learn something new. Mm -hmm. So I'd hold that close. Mm -hmm. Juan Felipe, what do you think? Well, I like what Naomi says, uh, you know, about uh, coming together, you know, uh, poets really coming together and coming together with the community. Uh, sometimes we get so concerned with publishing or we're just, it's just so demanding mm -hmm. and uh, we are so busy, everyone's so busy. So we're writing and publishing and writing and publishing and reading and we forget to, uh, to break those walls down and really hang out with each other, uh, meet each other like we're meeting each other today and also uh, walk in those streets and, and listen and, and be with people. <laughs> it sounds odd, it sounds <laughs> odd. But it's like we're in this big machine all of a sudden in the 21st century. Yeah. And uh, so many people are being left behind and we kind of li li uh, leave ourselves behind and each other behind. So um, Naomi's ma makes a lot of sense. It's let's, let's, br let's, create, so let's create incredible bridges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say that I love in this question the word responsibility mm -hmm. for its fundamental meaning of to respond. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're asking what is the role of a poet in a society, in a culture, in a country, in a community, it is to respond in the way that only poetry can. Mm. And a lot of that, just as your wonderful call for civility, poetry's summoning is also to transcend easy language, platitudinous language, slogans that make people stupid mm -hmm. and that separate people from mm -hmm. one another. Absolutely. And so part of the role of poetry and poets is, I think, to force ourselves past the common ways of looking at things mm -hmm. by being more responsive and by finding the uncommon, original, sidelong, nuanced, subtle, and, and not strive for the certainty which seems such a bane of our current discourse. Gorgeous, Jen. Gorgeous. <laughs> I love that. Can I please have that tattooed on the <laughs> No bang. No bang. No bang. No so beautiful. No Absolutely. Bang. Well, you know, uh, well, uh, things are things are kind of things are falling apart, and things are breaking apart. Yeah. And there's incredible uh, discourse. Many discourse, uh, many discourses in, in the world, and and in some ways uh, there's 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 a war of discourse, and 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 writers and human beings, all of us, <laughs> writers and human beings, all of us, uh, you know, are in that swirl of uh, of contestation. We're all um, uh, uh, we're we're all poets, and, and we're all. Um, uh, f looking for words, mm -hmm. we're all looking for words, and there's so, there's there's too many words, perhaps. Mm -hmm. There's perhaps there's too many mm -hmm. words right now, and and everyone's uh, uh, struggling uh, to find those words also, words to to talk about uh, the suffering, our suffering, mm -hmm. the suffering of peoples, and and there's 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 a fight in the media and different kinds of media, to to rep to present and represent what's really going on. So, so the established forms of, uh, of communication, established forms of, of uh, maybe reaching a, a, uh, a larger vision, mm -hmm. they're all kind of being taken over and they're being occupied or they're being uh, destroyed or they're being uh, dismantled. And all of a sudden we find ourselves um, in this desert of, of broken uh, uh, languages and shrapnelized uh, uh, versions of what to say, so uh, it, it's a tough time. So and it's a beautiful time because now we have to pick up the pieces and really find out what we really want to say and how to say it. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. 
Well, that was a beautiful answer. It's <laughs> um, <laughs> your fault. <laughs> and I would also say living in this time of muchness where so much is available and given all around and people are trying to tune in on so many frequencies, mm -hmm. uh, poetry better than anything I've ever found will slow us down yeah. quickly. Mm -hmm. Will give us that apprehension, the capacity to respond, as Jane said, mm -hmm. to respond with a, a meaningful, slow, kind of worthy gaze into something. Um, and it, it takes only a few moments to read a poem, to reread a stanza, to feel something in you sort of recomposing itself. And I think, uh, I think people are challenged at this time in history to feel focused mm -hmm. and to feel sort of intact within their own spirits and bodies. And, you know, there are many things, many experiences of art, which can help refurbish our souls. But poetry, by its very nature, does it so quickly and directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think we need it at this moment of muchness. Um, to be simplified. Mm -hmm. And I would agree, you know, I think that crises are ceaseless yeah. and debased language goes all the way back. But when you spoke about the level of distraction mm -hmm. that we all feel right now with the continual mm -hmm. clamoring mm -hmm. for attention in every direction, mm -hmm. and poems in a way are the language which has the deepest relationship to silence. Mm. And it summons, they are words that summon our interior quiet to meet them and comprehend them. Not every poem, but some right. poems. And you know, as each of you was talking just now, besides listening to your, your words, I for some reason, unlike myself, noticed your talismanic rings <laughs> and bracelets. <laughs> and this is part of what art, again, allows us to do. Oh. It takes the attention, which is you know, trying to think of the next thing to say and trying to listen to what's coming oh, right, in, right. and suddenly there is the gleam of beauty. Mm. And the gleam of beauty stops us and restores us to some taproot of being mm. from which compassion and thoughtfulness have a possibility of entering the room. Mm. Beautiful. And I like your talismanic necklace and earrings. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I want to. Yeah. Distraction, distraction, distraction. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm, I'm di well, I'm distracted and, and, and uh, I'm absorbed by it, actually. Yeah. I'm absorbed by it. And because I think that's 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 what we do, um, we 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 let ourselves go, and whatever is present, um, we're there with it. Mm -hmm. And if, if if it's a distractive, chaotic, uh, falling apart, blow not blowing up moment in the world or next to us or in the neighborhood or at home, or many thousands of miles away, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're we're with it. We're with it. So it's it's kind of a unique kind of distraction. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it just if, if it happens, then we're there with it. Mm. It's it's a it's a continual recalibration, yeah. um, a reminder, a tuning, a, a retuning. I sat next to someone in uh, Northern Ireland for three days ago, as she tuned a harp, and I realized I've never had this experience. You know, I played the guitar, played the violin. I've never sat with a harp tuning experience. And it took a long time because it has a lot of strings. And while she was tuning it, I felt as if uh -huh. I was becoming open and empty and ready to listen in the same way that a poem can often take you. And it just reminded me, you know, like whenever we recalibrate re to lines, to phrases, to language, it's as if we're tuning that harp inside us. And sometimes it has a lot of strings mm -hmm. because there are lots of tone tonalities in everybody's lives these days that's right. Right. Mm. right it goes back to if you are a being who has dedicated yourself to being responsive mm -hmm. then mm. you become very vulnerable right. to mm -hmm. everything that asks for your attention yeah. right. and then perhaps the responsibility is to choose to some degree 
what you are going to give yourself over to and when you must pick yourself up because otherwise we could just fall into this river of distraction mm. and never come out and fall into the river of what we're asked to do and mm. never come out. And part of my responsibility to poetry is occasionally to step back and mm. say, I think not. I think this is, you know, a sabbatical from the outer distraction is in order and mm. a an immersion into the deeper levels, which for me are only accessible if I'm not answering emails. Right. I can't wake up in the morning, answer emails, and then say, ah, time to write a poem. Mm -hmm. um, that's the wrong order of <laughs> taking care of existence. <laughs> 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 it takes discipline. But it also mm -hmm. takes intention and yeah. vow. Yes. It takes yeah. a decision. Right. And I think this is a decision that we hope that the arts are modeling for everyone, mm -hmm. that if a person has an experience of sheen and joy and opulence, including the opulence of grief, yeah. including even the opulence of anxiety, uh -huh. mm -hmm. that they might feel themselves somehow altered in a way that makes them feel this is worth doing. Mm -hmm. That's what art offers. Mm -hmm. It can't mm -hmm. make anybody taken. Mm -hmm. It can only offer something which rewards in a way that makes a person say, I want this in my life. Right. I will intend to invite this into my life. Mm -hmm. Both in giving poetry readings and also listening to other poets read, yeah. Yeah. I think this, this sense of to go back to the community yeah. It's a place where you can participate in the art with the ears and eyes and hearts of others in the same room, and you feel that. Yeah. So, you know, it's not always necessary. Reading, reading somebody else's poem alone in a room can be utterly mm -hmm. yes. undoing and transformative. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you love that poem, and then you've got the poet's voice in your ear as well. Now, giving readings for me was very hard to learn how to do. I was terrified of performing in public when I was a young woman. Really? Oh, yes. I mean, I shook. It was, it was awful for me. Yeah. But, you know, after, after the first year that I did it 35 times and I realized I was going to live, <laughs> I gradually became able to just be with the poem. Yeah. Be with the poem and be in the room and be with other people and bring it forward as midwife. Mm -hmm. And after that, readings became much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's great, you know. It's great. It is like that, isn't it? At, at the beginning, uh, I, I kind of began this whole thing when I was in uh, uh, around sixth grade, and uh, I, I thought I wanted to. Uh, I, had, I had memorized uh, one of the uh, uh, poems my mother used to learn probably in third grade, which was her last grade, and in Paso, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, because she was taken out by my grandmother because she uh, stole some candy. A little piece of candy with her girlfriend, and my grandmother said, "Well, it looks like you're not serious about school, so so, so from here on out, oh. so from here on out, you're going to stay home, and you're going to stay home with me until until I fall on that floor and, and I'm dead. So until that day, uh, you're you're going to be at home uh, with me. It looks like you're not interested in school, but she was. She loved she loved school. She loved writing. She loved you know spelling. I mean, up until third grade." and the uh, poems, the ones that she had learned. And she had learned one called uh, Underneath, uh, the, apple, uh, underneath uh, the Apple Tree and something about a brown house. And uh, so I had memorized it in third grade. I, I, uh, I made sure that I had all the lines together and then I said to myself, oh, well, it looks like I'm gonna need a, <laughs> gonna need a tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> And that was that was the last thing I, I knew. Yeah, you know, that was the last thing I, I could ever imagine, and it was impossible. It was like I don't know, going to Saturn and back. I said, "Well, how do I do that?" So I went downtown uh, San Francisco on Market and Van Ness, and right there there was a little tuxedo shop. And I went across the street because I, 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 it was just too much for me to right. attempt to to do at that moment. So I said, "I'm going to go across the street." And I'm going to see with my binocular eyes if I can actually distinguish a tuxedo in there. And I had 10 bucks in my pocket. I said, I'm sure it costs around $10 or $5. <laughs> so um, how can I do this? How can I do this? I said, oh, this is just, this is just 
this is this is way too much. You know, this, this, I guess I'm not going to read the poem. This is this is, you know, how am I going to get that tuxedo anyway? So I went back home and I forgot about the tuxedo, and it looked it looked just impossible to me. So I went back to school and um, and I did a report on the Bay of Fundy instead of do, <laughs> instead of doing that poem. So anyway, so by eighth grade I decided to get rid of all the nerves and face face myself and the fear and everything else that I had going. And I got into choir and after many years of choir I finally got on campus at UCLA and I got on that free speech mound, hmm. Kirkhoff Plaza, and I was still super nervous and still super scared. But I said I have to get up here and I'm gonna and I started to squeak because I was shouting. And if you shout you eventually in seven seconds you're gonna bring your voice out and you you're gonna sound like Mickey Mouse. So I, that's what happened to me, and I kept on doing it, kept on doing it, until I, I got more into it, and uh, I really wanted to do it, and it didn't matter anyway. Until the poem, the reading, you know, became kind of uh, this very big, this immense, immense space. It wasn't just me anymore, yeah. and it wasn't really my voice anymore, and it really wasn't this thing anymore. Mm-hmm. It was this, this, this infinite. Uh, I don't know what it was. There's infinite space, infinite people. I don't know what it was. The lawn, the people, the everybody, the faces, the heat, and what I was doing, whatever that was, and this big gy- cosmic gyration, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what became the uh, the beauty the beauty of it all, yeah. and the incredible the incredible energy of it all, and and uh, so that what it, that's what it all led to. But I started with. Uh, Underneath this apple tree, and that tuxedo, and I, I, I uh, <laughs> then I ended up in. You didn't need the tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need the tuxedo. <laughs> when did I realize that then? <laughs> I know. You know. Well, I think a lot about um, empathy, one community to another, uh, paying attention with respect and curiosity to people who aren't exactly like us. And um, I think poetry can often help us do that, help us have a, a window into someone else's experience or loneliness or difficulty. Um, and having worked with kids so many years and seeing uh, often a, a, a kind of respect rising up after someone describes something uh, with an honest voice, what changes in the room, uh, I'm very disturbed by rudeness and um, meanness and having grown up with an immigrant father and thinking about the way immigrants are being talked about in our society. I feel really a strong desire to talk about the bravery of the immigrant and the, the sort of doubled capacity for imagination that an immigrant has to have. And I think poetry can often help us do that in a way that isn't didactic but is caring and t- kind of takes us into the room. And I'm very curious and hopeful when kids are wanting to read poems about people who aren't exactly like themselves. Mm-hmm. People who don't, I don't believe that we have a hunger to be only with others who match us. Right. That's kind of dull. I'd much rather be with all kinds of people. And uh, I think We can bring that up over and over again these days in poetry, and it has a great societal impact. Well said. Thank you. Yeah, variety is a good thing, isn't it? (laughs) Variety is a good thing. Good luck if you don't like it. What's going to happen to you? Yeah, you know, uh, (laughs) but you know, there's so many walls, and there's so many, uh, there's a lot of, you know, what is it? It's like a new segregation taking place or something. And, and then there's all these kind of stereotypical, uh, what is it? The manufactured ways of talking about each other mm. and about others, which is each other, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, and it seems to be uh, getting uh, kind of more crystallized and or, and more hardened, the way uh, yeah. we are mm-hmm. all talking about each other and, and about others and this group and that group. And I think uh, well, poetry is like the. Uh, that's like the, the what is it? Uh, uh, the solvent or, or, or that that magical uh, mm. 
uh, liquid or, or rain. It's like rain, mm -hmm. and it kind of softens everything up. And regardless of what we write, mm -hmm. what, regardless of what we write, you know, it's like uh, all of a sudden, you know, like you had said a while ago, we kind of slow down mm -hmm. and and, uh, and we kind of uh, pay attention and a new kind of attention, and uh, we're kind of gone. We're kind of gone, and we kind of kind of connect. We connected. In whatever manner it is, whether it's a wild manner, or a manner of uh, feeling really uh, together, or just a manner uh, of reflection, of, re of reflective moment, and all and, and all these these bandages and mummifications that we've uh, kind of uh, uh, pasted ourselves onto during the eight hours of the day, they kind of kind of fall away. Yeah. Uh, but but you're right about uh, uh, issues about immigration and immigrants and migrants. Those two uh, are, are not really talked about uh, enough in, 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 in a positive way, mm -hmm. in a positive way. Um, you know, I have a piece that's called Border Bus, and, and I, I wanted to, uh, uh, two women in a bus, and, and the bus has crossed, it has been detained. The women have been detained with a group of other women and, and some children, and this happened recently. And it was really, uh, it really got to me. Yeah. <laughs> it really got to me because they already had been arrested and they had already been thrown in a bus and they didn't know where they were going. And they were supposed to be going to a detention center and a holding tank and, uh, you know, with all kinds of guards. And they're going towards this place. And the place, the people in that particular place didn't allow this bus to come in. I said, well, now what on earth, you know, come on. They've been arrested. They're going to a detention center. They're going to be quote-unquote processed and put in some jail with a blanket and a glass of water. But you can't even get to that. So I'm not going to read all of it. it, it I enjoyed writing this because it's, it's kind of a performance piece. Um, so I'll just read you uh, the last fourth of it. And uh, it's bilingual and, and it, it all comes together. Anyway, and they're having this kind of argument. What are you talking about? I told you to be quiet, one of the women says. There's two of them. La libertad viene de muy adentro. Allí reside todo el dolor de todo el mundo. El momento en que nos purguemos de ese dolor de nuestras entrañas, seremos libres. Y en ese momento tenemos que llenarnos de todo el dolor de todos los seres para liberarnos, para liberarlos a ellos mismos. Freedom comes from deep inside. All the pain of the world lives there. The second we cleanse that pain from our guts, we shall be free. And at that moment, we have to fill ourselves up with all the pain of all beings to free them, all of them. Guard is coming. Well, now what? Maybe they'll take us to another detention center. We'll eat. We'll have a, we'll have a floor, a blanket, toilets, water, and each other for a while. No somos nada, y venimos de la nada, y por eso nada, y por esa nada lo es, es todo. Si la nutres de amor, por eso venceremos. We are nothing, and we come from nothing. But that nothing is everything if you feed it with love. That is why we will triumph. We are everything, hermana, because we come from everything. So they're talking to each other, and one has this point of view, and one has that point of view. And one wants to speak in English, and tells the other one to speak in English. And the other one just keeps in Spanish, because that's all she can speak. Mm -hmm. And she says, we come from nothing. And the other one says, we come from everything. Mm -hmm. right. Because we come from everything. We are everything. So, so that's, that's what I did with that piece about that border bus. And so powerful that is. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely extraordinary and absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And you know, hard, hard to follow that by going back to um, something more general. But yeah. I, I think for me, I never know what I'm going to write about until I do. I don't have ideas of what my subject matter are, in part because I'm always looking for the next subject matter. What, what have I never looked at before? And yet at a certain point in a life, you look back and you begin to see there are themes. Okay. And along with the 
more personal themes that I think we all must deal with as poets, um, love, loss, grief, uh, the relationships of, of the private life, the experience of interiority. I, I have been noticing, and other people have been noticing, that there are themes in my work I wouldn't have, have realized were so recurrent. And one of them is justice, mm -hmm. that from my earliest book, I have investigated justice. One of them is war grief. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a poem from the mid 80s about a totally forgotten thing, the United States invasion of the island of Grenada. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just say, you know, it doesn't ever stop it doesn't ever stop, and it still hasn't stopped. And there are poems of war grief in every one of my books, um, yeah. not taking a side either, not, not, you know, not, not partisan, right. just grief that, that as a species we keep doing this. There are poems uh, dedicated to this idea so beautifully embodied in your poem of the interconnection of all beings, mm -hmm. and also our interconnection with the non-human. Mm -hmm. And so poems of the environment and the environmental crisis go through many, many books. Mm -hmm. um, and poems looking at the idea of fate and our relationship to fate and choice, which I think is part of the questioning of justice. Mm -hmm. You know, how much yeah. is it an accident where we were born, what we were born into, what language we're born into, yeah. what country and culture we're born mm -hmm. into, mm -hmm. and how much is our capacity within this very specific life that we each lead to both embody that life and also reach beyond it. Mm -hmm. And I think all of, all of these themes have, have pervaded my work in ways that surprise me. Um, a, a great dedication to internationalism. I mean, my own family, uh, you know, the immigration experience was a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially compared to either of you. Mm -hmm. But my feeling that, and I, I rather like that even though we're here for the National Book Festival, you haven't asked us about being American poets. And that's an interesting question, you know, because this is what American poetry looks like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It is a poetry of the world, yes. of world heritage, of many streams coming in together. Um, even for a Native American poet of the 21st century, this would be true. And so I suppose if, if do you do you want us to read read poems I now do. to yes, follow to great. follow on that? So I, I think I will choose a a new poem which does respond to um, the ecological crisis we find our we find ourselves in. Um, and, and are responding to that and what we do and what we, what we haven't done. So a poem of guilt and a poem of awareness, I suppose. Let them not say. Let them not say we did not see it. We saw. Let them not say we did not hear it. We heard. Let them not say they did not taste it. We ate. We tasted. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written. We spoke. We witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing. We did not enough. Let them say, as they must say something, a kerosene beauty, it burned. Let them say we warmed ourselves by it, read by its light, praised, and it burned. That sense of litany, Jane, that you, you take us into a whole rhythm of kind of grieving and attentive listening. Mm -hmm. Do you have a poem that you can read? I have a poem called All the Names We Will Not Know, mm -hmm. and it's for an artist friend of mine, Adriana Coral, and it also is a border poem, going back to your poem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before dawn, trembling in air down to the old river, circulating gently as a new season, delicate still, 
in its softness, rustling raiment of hopes never stitched tightly enough to any hour. I was almost, maybe, just about going to do that. A girl's thick, dark hair brushed over one shoulder so regularly no one could imagine it not being there. Hair as a monument, hovering, pitched. Beloved sister, maker of plans, main branch, we needed you desperately. Where have you gone? Here is the sentence called, no, 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 no. Come back, everything grants you your freedom. Here in the mire of too much thinking, we drown, we drown, split by your echo. Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about the we drown line with all the refugees and immigrants who've been drowning uh, recently uh. and the small children carried up onto the beach and so it goes back to, for me to the title all the names we will not know and all the people in desperate circumstances and uh, um, and the, the tragedy of it and to me that that sense of protection for one another you know creating whatever protection we can through language through government um, is so much more important than divisiveness and takes possibly less energy and less anger. So um, thank you both for your poems. Oh, thank you for your poem. Thank you.